And then we can sing, we can do whatever else we're going to do. But turn to Titus chapter number 1 with me this morning, please. Titus chapter 1. Titus 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. Note carefully now verse number 2. In hope of eternal life which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Father, bless this holy book now. Give me unction to preach it. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Now we're going to preach today, and it's going to be kind of a study, because I'm going to try to bring out for you what the Bible says. And I think that's so important as to what the Bible says. Amen. It's very important to understand that. Salvation is what's mentioned here in verse number 2, in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie, now watch carefully the wording of this, promised before the world began. The last word in that sentence is began. That's the Greek word chronos. We get chronology in English straight from the Greek, and it simply means the measurement of time, okay? A chronograph is something that measures time, speed, time. So the Apostle Paul is telling you in verse number 2 of Titus, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before time began. That's exactly what that means, all right? Before time began in eternity past. Now we're going to connect that in a minute to the mind and to the will of God and to his wisdom. But notice carefully now what's going on here. In verse number 2 he said, the promise of eternal life. God Almighty works all things according to an eternal purpose. There is an eternal purpose that has to do with everything that God has ever done for us. That in itself is a separate study to try to, for God to reveal to you the eternal purpose of God. There's a lot of people out there that believe God, a deist, for example, deist and theist, they believe God made the universe, but he just turned it loose and let it run its course. And that's not at all true. God is involved in every tick of your heart, in every beat of your heart, every movement of your soul. You are here today because in eternity before time began, God Almighty ordained it to be so. That's something you ought to be thankful for. You ought to think about because you are not an accident. There's a reason for you in living. Now, the Bible talks, it talks about the world time and time again. The world, the world, the world. There's two Greek words that are translated world. One is cosmos and the other one is eon. We get our, it's aeon rather, and we get our English word eon from it. And it has to do with ages. For example, it says in the book of Matthew chapter 13 verse 35 that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. This is the Greek word cosmos, the foundation of the created universe, the planet that is part of this creation. Therefore, world is used there. John 11 and verse number 19, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world, of the creation, of this planet, the sun that shines through the daytime. Then the Bible refers to the world in a different nuance. John chapter number 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world, and, and for God so loved the world that he, and gave, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The world here is the total of humanity. He's not talking about the planet. He's talking about the people on this planet. So therefore he loved all of mankind. Note, note carefully, folks. Not just the elect. The elect are the elect. But he loved the world. For God so loved the world. 
So therefore, the total of humanity. But then there's another, uh, another nuance in the way world is used in the New Testament. And you'll find that in 1 Corinthians chapter number 7 and verse number 33. Here's what it says. But he that is married careth for the things that are of this world, how he may please his wife. 2 Timothy 4.10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. What he's saying is that all, even though that Demas was an apostle, he was a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was a believer in him, that the pull of this world, in other words, its joys, its senses, it's life, it's God, everything that has to do with what people in this world live for that don't know God, and believe me, the list is long. The Bible says that Demas went back into that world. So it's not talking about the planet, it's talking about the people of the world and their spirit. Every age has a spirit attached to that age. You are watching the development of a spirit in here in 2022 in America. What do you want to just look a little bit? You ought to just read a little bit. You ought to just watch some YouTube and see how that cultures in this world, especially in Eastern Europe and places like that, are retaining their cultural identity. And they're doing it in the face of the rot of Western culture. Our culture is rotting under your very feet. You're watching the destruction of everything that we've ever held dear. Yet these people, these people in another part or other parts of the world are maintaining their cultural identity. Why? Because they do not want to be connected and associated with what this country and Western civilization has become. How many agree with what I said now? You understand? I mean, I can't go another step, even though you understand me. You, you fully realize what I'm saying. You're in agreement that the country that you live in has abandoned Christ, abandoned God, and they have taken the God of this world. See? The God of this world. And so they've taken him, and he is their eyes of worship. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse number 19, it says this. It says, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. What is this? This is the rebellion. Rebellion is the issue of man, the fallen man's relationship with God. He is in total rebellion against God. He will not. God will not tell me how to live. There is no God. We'll do away with him. He'll cease to be. That's all they scream day in and day out. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm going to live any way I please. And you're watching it as it develops. So the Bible says in John chapter number 12 and verse number 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I came into this world. I came to this world. There's a number of reasons why he came into this world, but one of them was to judge Satan. And he judged him in the flesh. In weakness, the Lord Jesus Christ met Satan face on and defeated him. Amen. And that's a good thing to know. So in John chapter number 18 and verse number 36, the scripture says this. My kingdom is not of this world. Cosmos. If my kingdom were this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. That's quite a thing to think about. Think about that. Meditate on that. Go home and think about what he just said. Then would my servants fight. In Revelation 19, I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he that judge and make peace. Make war. I'm glad you're listening <laughs> so you can correct me. And make war. But that's not today. That's in the future. So he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were this world, cosmos, world, were people, the God of this world, their mindset, their possessions, their heroes, their hope. He said, my kingdom is not of this. He said, if my kingdom were this, my servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is not my kingdom from hence. And so therefore we've got an understanding in scripture 
as to what cosmos means. Now, there's another word in the Bible, and that is eon. And eon has to do with eternal purposes because eon is an issue of time. It's the passing of time. It is the segmenting of time. It is the appointment of time. What's going to happen in a certain time? How long will that time last? What's God going to do during that period of time? The Bible calls them ages. There's an idiom in Greek. It's aistus, ionos, ton, ionon. And that literally means into the ages of the ages. Boy, that has a ring to it, doesn't it? Instead of just saying forever, unto the ages of the ages. He makes you think. It spreads it out. It gives you an idea. My, that's a long time. To the ages of the ages. The book of Revelation mentions that 12 times. Revelation uses that term 12 times. So what do you mean by that? The book of Revelation is dealing with unto the ages of the ages. It is looking into eternity, eternity of eternity. The book of Revelation, therefore, is saying things that, that bear upon your eternity. You make eternal decisions. Every time you get up and walk out of this building, you have made an eternal decision. And that eternal decision bears on your soul. Where is your soul going to go when it leaves this temporal world? You're going into eternity. And eternity existed before time. Because time is an age. And unto the ages of the ages is looking, back in, looking forward into eternity. Go back now to Titus chapter number 1. And look what the apostle says in verse number 2. In Titus chapter number 1 and verse number 2, let's look at the text carefully. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before time, before the world began. Now look at this. God's purpose, and his purpose is, is wide indeed, but his purpose as it relates to you, human beings, was before time he had already established eternal life. Amen. Amen. Now just soak that in for a moment. Before time he had it settled that this was the purpose of God. Eternal life. Now I'm going to tell you something right now. I wouldn't want to live another day without God. Amen. And he told them in the garden, he said, lest they take of the fruit of this tree and live forever in a fallen condition, rotting away every day of their existence. No, eternal life is the life of God. Eternal, yes, not my life. Can't you see how your life can spin out of control? Can't you, do you understand what I'm saying? I swear it's some folks in minds up here. What are you thinking about the race this afternoon? <laughs> like last week, it was the ball game. Some stupid nothing that will be here and gone and will have no effect on your life whatsoever. It wasn't making a difference what's going to happen to you. And those people that, that played last Sunday and raced today couldn't care if you live or die. You're making a hero out of nothing. The one I'm talking to you about this morning died for you. He died for you. Amen. But see, that's just an indication of the rot of American culture. I guess I'm mad this morning. I just stirred up because I get so sick of this mamby-pamby soft American culture. Everything just handed to you. Don't you get tired of that? I get tired of it. I'm talking about eternal things. Eternal salvation was ordained before time began. And then what happened? Time begins and the ages roll on. And that's where we are because time begins and it moves on. Look at Ephesians chapter number 3 and verse number 9. You reckon the Lord's mad at me? Or you reckon he'll forgive me for all this I'm going through here this morning? I have to go home and repent. That's one thing about it. You can preach too much, you can sing too much, you can play too much, but you can't pray too much and you can't repent too much. <laughs> but add that to it. Ephesians chapter number 3 and verse 9. Look at this. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. 
Now look at this, verse 11. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. He had an eternal purpose in manifesting his wisdom through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he said. In plain words, when you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, you're looking at the wisdom of God. And you read about that wisdom personified in the book of Proverbs when it talks about that wisdom was with God before the first man was ever made. His mind is wisdom. His hand is wisdom. His walk is wisdom. His voice is wisdom. Everything about the Lord Jesus Christ is a manifestation of the wisdom of God. Amen. Hallelujah to God. They ought to love him. I love him. I bless him and I praise him and I can't praise him enough. Glory to God. There's nowhere I can go that he won't be there and I bless his righteous name and I'm alive because he's alive and I'm saved because he can save. Hallelujah. I owe him everything. I owe him every breath I breathe. I owe him every bite that I eat. I owe him for everything the Lord Jesus Christ. For to me to live is Christ, the apostle said. And to die is gain. One day you're going to step into eternity. And when you step into eternity, if the ages are still rolling on, it'll be in some age. Right now we live in what's called the age of grace. But there is a time when God shall gather together all things in Christ. That's a different age. But the Bible talks about the ages. Unto the ages of the ages. The wisdom of God is manifest in Christ Jesus. How many agree with that? He's the wisdom of God. 2 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 9. 2 Timothy 1, 9. Look at this text carefully with me now. 2 Timothy 1, 9. Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. The purpose of God is not taken in cons consultation with angels, nor cherubim, nor seraphim. There is nothing in the Bible that tells me that they existed even when God had the eternal purpose. The Lord God Almighty, the eternal absolute being that needs nothing, that has, he has no need of anything. He exists because he exists. That it's somewhere in eternity. And we can't pinpoint it because there's no dates in eternity. But in it, in that eternity, in that eternal past, that he has a purpose and there could never very well a cherubim, a seraphim, angels, and all of that. But the Bible says in the book of Job that when he made the world, he made the world, that the angels rejoiced. Sons of God shouted for glory. Here they are. There's only God. And here are these angels. There were no men. They were before us. And here's the Almighty. Here's the angels. And the Almighty says, move over. <laughs> and there everything that comes into existence. Good night. And he said, now let's get down to serious business. <laughs> because that's just the stars also. I'm going to make man, and when I make him, I'm going to make him in my image. And therefore, when man came on the scene, everything changed. Why would God make you in his image? What's he doing? What's his point? What's the purpose in all of this? Look at Ephesians chapter number 1 and verse 11. Ephesians 1.11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. His purpose. See how the word's used? Over and over and over again. But look at Hebrews chapter number 5. Now this is a beautiful thing. I hope you can see it with me. Hebrews chapter number 5 and verse number 9. What a scripture. Hebrews 5, 9. Now look at this. The Bible said, though he were a son, verse 8, yet he learned obedience for things which he suffered. Now look at verse 9. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. Now hold on. Let's put it together for a moment. Eternal salvation was in the purpose of God before anything was ever made. The eternal salvation existed into eternity past. But it had no authorship. 
You see, the salvation that the apostles talking about in the book of Hebrews says that when someone came into this world, he became the author of eternal salvation. What's that mean? That means the word author simply means the beginner, the cause, what brought it into being. In plainer words, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ lived out on this earth is what drew up, what drew up God's relationship with man when it comes to salvation. The life he lived, his perfect sinless life, qualifies him as the high priest. But just a step further, he is the author of eternal salvation. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the door. The Son of God is the way to the Father. So what do you mean by that, preacher? I mean the Bible says he's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. That's what he said. And he was, Lazarus. So your salvation... The salvation of a man is based upon the fact that when God begins to move and work in your soul, he understands sorrow and grief. The Bible says right here that when he was taken and his, his anointing into the wilderness, 40 days he was tested of Satan. His flesh hungered and he was he was beaten spiritually by Satan for 40 days. Your flesh will hunger and you will be beaten by Satan. Now I'll make my point some other way for you. He didn't write down somewhere a, pa a page and said, all right, I'm going to save them. And here it is. No. He said, I'm going to save them. And here's how I'm going to save them. But the how didn't show up till Christ showed up. Now, does that make more sense for you? That's the how. Because when the Lord Jesus Christ showed up, he wrote out the script. It was his perfect life on this earth. In other words, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying he understands you. <laughs> I'm saying he knows you from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. I'm saying he understands why men say what they say and what they do and when they do it. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that the God you serve knows you better than you know you. <laughs> and all of that he figured in to eternal salvation because he's the author of it. He's the architect. He's the designer. He's the one who said, this is a human being and this is how I'll lead them to salvation. I know every step they'll take. He was betrayed. He was rejected. Have you been re betrayed and rejected? Yeah. You ever had that happen to you? We all have. I grew up in rejection, folks. You've heard me say it a thousand times. Say it again. All I knew was rejection. And I became so sensitive to it. Until that night in that brother-in-law's living room, I said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And something came down on my soul. It was the glory of God that came into me. You couldn't have told me what that was. Five minutes before that, I had no clue. But when God saved my soul on that thing, something came into me. He saved me. He gave me something in my heart. The Holy Ghost moved in. And when that happened, folks, I've been trying my best to tell people about that since then. And unless you've experienced it, all you know is a bunch of rules and regulations and do's and don't do's and commandments and religious rituals and stuff like that. That's all you know. That's all you know. And you think that's what the church is about. The church is not about. The church is about a person. The Lord Jesus Christ who is blessed forever. Hallelujah to his name. So he becomes the, he becomes the author of eternal salvation. And that happened in time. He didn't become the author in eternity. That happened in time. And there's quite a remarkable thing said about that. Look at Luke chapter 13, verse 33. Luke chapter 13. Start with verse 32. Luke 13, 32. He said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox. Huh. He, he, he would use a figure of speech, you know. Go ye and tell that fox, behold, I cast out devils. I do cures today and tomorrow. Now watch this. And the third day I shall be perfected. A perfect salvation was consummated when he said, Father, into thy hands 
I come in my spirit and breathed his last. He breathed out the breath of life. He breathed out the breath of the God-man. Now listen carefully. On the third day when God raised him from the dead, breath came back into the God-man, but not a breath that could ever be breathed out again. He raised him from the dead, never to die again. Death has no touch. Death cannot touch him. He can never be killed. He can never die. He's alive eternally. He'd become a victor over death, hell, and the grave. Do you believe that? I believe that. He's my Savior. So, he was perfected. Perfected. Here's the wisdom of God and perfection. Here's the wisdom of God and the sacrifice that was made. And then finally, here's the wisdom of God in the offering of Christ. The Bible says in the book of John, he's the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Well, you say, I've never heard the gospel. Why? There's a light that lights every man that comes into the world. How much truth do you want? Do you want the truth? Or do you want to just keep hiding behind ignorance? What do you want to do? Spend all your life running here, there? Or do you want the truth? He said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will do what? Do you want the truth? Somebody will take a Bible, open it up. You can come down here, and we'll pray with you, and we'll show you the truth. And then it's your decision to receive the truth or reject it. That's the great thing called volition is a big word. It simply means will. You have a will. They don't put, uh, you know, you don't take like a dog or something like that. You put a loop around their neck and lead them around. No, you're a human being. You're a man. You're a woman. You have a will. You can choose what you're going to do with the truth. First of all, do you believe Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe he died? Not swoon, he died, he was buried, a borrowed tomb, tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, third day raised from the dead. Do you believe that? When he died, death, burial, resurrection of Christ, he died for you, he died, he's your sin bearer. He's, he not only is your sin bearer, he took your place on the cross. Amen. And you believe that? Do you know you're a sinner? Not a matter of believing, you are one. Well, I don't sin, yes you do. We're all sinners. You're, all right, I'm a sinner. What am I going to do about my sin? Christ is the only one that can do anything for your sin. The Lord Jesus Christ. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. Would you come today? Clear up all. Clear up. A lot of people get in confusion today because America is a cafeteria of every kind of religious garbage there is. Well, it doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you believe in it, you know, everything's okay, as long as you're sincere enough about it. No, it's not. No, it's not. There's only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. There's only one Savior among men, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. I ask you in Jesus' name, you see the wisdom of God. Do I believe in the wisdom of God? Oh, yes. Do I believe God's smarter than me? Oh, yeah. So what am I going to do? I'm going to accept what God says is the wisdom of God, which is Christ Jesus the Lord. I'm going to say, I may not understand all of this about salvation. You don't have to. But I believe in your son. And I'm going to accept him into my heart. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to trust him to save me. Would you do that? Bow your head. Father, in Jesus' name, I gave you what you gave me. And I bless you and praise your sweet, righteous name. Now, I don't mind looking. I don't want anybody looking. I want this to be a personal, private time between you and the Lord. There's nothing going on outside this building today that's more important than what's happening with your soul right now. Right now. This is what's called the moment of decision. You decide. Joshua said, choose you this day whom you'll serve. He said, it's for me and my house. We're going to serve the Lord. He made his choice. Joshua was a type of Jesus. His name's even used twice for Jesus in the New Testament. Why don't you come down here right now? Come down here. We'll open the Bible and we'll show you how to be saved. Would you do it? Would you do it? Would you come right now? Folks, I preach to you the wisdom of God and salvation and how it took his life. He lived it. It took his life to draw up what saves the sinner and how the sinner comes to God and the work of the Holy Ghost. 
Would you come? Come? It'll be the greatest thing you ever did in this world is when you come. Would you come? Would you raise your hand? Would you do that much and raise your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me. I know I need something. I do. But I'm not sure yet. I'm still confused. I'm still, I'm still reluctant. I'm seeking. I'm searching. I'm asking. I'm whatever you're doing. Would you raise your hand and say, pray for me, preacher? Anybody? Anybody? God bless you. Hands there. Father, you saw these hands. There's a hand back there. You saw them, Lord. You saw them. I'm just the messenger. I have no power to draw anybody. I have no power. No man has the power to draw you. That is the power of the Holy Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit of God. That's the power. Father, I pray for them. I pray for those that raised their hand and those that didn't raise their hand. We bring them before thee in Jesus' name. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I know your word won't return void. Father, I don't expect some kind of a quick response. It may happen that way, but it probably won't, but that's okay. The seed has been sown. Maybe you'll raise up a brother after me and he'll water it. Maybe you raised up one before me and he sowed it and I watered it today. It doesn't make any difference. Neither he that soweth or watereth or anything. That's fine. I'm doing what you call me to do. But bless them. Let your word now take root and see salvation in Jesus' name. And amen. Well, let's stand up and sing one verse. <clears throat> 